on behalf of the board of directors at the Center for Interfaith Relations and uh, our deep and talented staff at the uh, Center and at the Festival of Faith, we welcome you and thank you for being with us today. Uh, it's really wonderful to see such a great group of thoughtful and engaged people, um, and we're just delighted to have you with us here today. This is Essential Conversations for Steps. It's the first of two sessions that we're offering as a lead up to the 2021 Festival of Faiths. This year's festival is November 18th through the 20th, and the theme is Sacred Change, Essential Conversations on Faith and Race. Uh, the festival in November is being curated by prominent local Black theologians, and it is a contemporary look at the spiritual implications of systemic racism today. We encourage you, uh, if you're interested in the festival, to call the Kentucky Center for Performing Arts and, um, and, and get your tickets now. I want to open today's session with a profound statement of gratitude to Dan Gediman for his work as producer for the extraordinary podcast, The Reckoning, Facing the Legacy of Slavery in America. I believe for many of you, as it did for me, it began a, a, a true journey of reckoning, and we are all profoundly grateful for this work. It was the work of this podcast that led to our decision to invite Dan uh, and his guests to be part of this Essential Conversations series. It is an opportunity for all of us to get very specific about our history in uh, our state of Kentucky. Um, and through his podcast, we were able to really get the context of uh, not only our history, but our people and our systems. Uh, we are honored that Dan has agreed to curate this program. So before uh, introducing Dan and starting the program, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we have an hour for this presentation. We are holding the last 10 minutes of the program for some question and answers. And if anyone watching this program today has any questions, if you could put it into the chat, uh, we'll collect them and then we'll try to get as many of those answered at the end of the hour as we can. And now uh, about Dan Gediman. Uh, he is a longtime public radio producer who has been heard on popular programs like All Things Considered, Morning Edition, Marketplace, and This American Life. During his career, he has won many public broadcasting uh, prestigious awards for his work, such as Breaking the Cycle, How Do We Stop Child Abuse, I Just Am Who We Are, A Portrait of Multiple Personality Disorder, and 50 Years After 14 August, for which he earned the DuPont Columbia Award for his collaboration with famed radio dramatist Norman Corwin. More recently, Dan produced an audible documentary series, The Homefront, Life in America During World War II, which is narrated by Martin Sheen and was nominated for two Audi Awards. awards. For many years, Dan was the executive producer of the very popular uh, public radio series, This I Believe. He, has, he also has edited nine This I Believe books, including a New York Times bestseller, This I Believe, The Personal Philosophies of Remarkable Men and Women, he is currently the executive producer and host of the radio and podcast series, The Reckoning, Facing the Legacy of Slavery in America. And with these impressive credentials, I now hand over this program to Dan Gediman and his guests. All right, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so what we're gonna be doing here for the next hour is um, exploring the nexus of religion and slavery, specifically here in Kentucky, where we're based. Um, and we have two guests who are going to speak to that. And the way we've sort of structured this uh, presentation today is um, to sort of gradually uh, move the lens in tighter and tighter and tighter to look at, start, I'm going to start by talking about sort of in a general way, how intrinsically slavery was integrated into the economy, the culture uh, of daily life uh, in Kentucky. Then I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Dr. Luke Harlow, who is a, a professor of history, who has written a book uh, called Religion, Race, and the Making of Confederate Kentucky. And he's going to talk in more depth about in particular the, the sort of the politics of what happened in Kentucky during the slavery era. 
And then uh, in the final third, we're going to talk to Dr. Uh, sorry, Sister Teresa Nabel, who's with the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, who has deeply explored the history of her order as it relates to slaveholding. Um, and so uh, that's, that's sort of the structure of this hour. So I'm going to start by sharing some information with you, uh, some of which may be familiar to you, and I suspect a lot of it will not be. So I'm going to share my screen here um, and share this presentation with you um, about the legacy of slavery in, in, in specifically in Kentucky. So slave ownership rates in Kentucky were unusually high not so much in terms of the total number of people who were enslaved here, but in the percentage of people who were enslavers. So by the 1850 census, 28% of all white Kentucky families owned at least one enslaved person. The average uh, slaveholder had five enslaved people in the state of Kentucky. Only five people owned more than 100 uh, people. Uh, the largest or one of the largest slaveholders in Jefferson County was a man named William Christian Bullitt, uh, who owned the Oxmoor Plantation, where the Oxmoor Shopping Mall is today. Um, and he and his family and the people they enslaved are largely the focus of the first season of the radio series, The Reckoning. So enslavers made money in three ways. This is true all over the country, but particularly we're talking about Kentucky. Number one, their labor free labor. Secondly, the, re the revenue that they would bring in from leasing their enslaved people to other people, whether that was as farm workers, as factory workers, uh, working in coal mines, uh, working as artisans, blacksmiths, carpenters, etc. Um, also, there were a substantial number of enslaved people who worked on the river boats um, and, and on the shipping industry, either as stevedores, um, loading and unloading ships or actually working on the ships. Um, then the third way people made money was by bar borrowing against the value of their enslaved people, which enabled them to purchase land, more enslaved people, or invest in a business. Um, and uh, unlike other kinds of property other than livestock, because human beings reproduce the enslavers' assets increase exponentially depending upon the number of children that are born. So all of this allows for upward mobility in Kentucky uh, in particular. So here's an example. This is taken from the scholarship of Blaine Hudson, professor, the late professor Blaine Hudson from the University of Louisville. He looked at this one uh, particular guy from Owen County who starts out as an illiterate farmer, small, very small farmer in 1819, who has two enslaved people and by uh, assiduously managing his property, he gets uh, progressively more land, more people, more land, more people, and more wealth. And by uh, the dawn of the Civil War, he has a, uh, a net val a net, um, his assets add up to nearly $13,000, which is quite a bit of money in today's dollars. So it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, certainly in today's money. So, this gives you an, ex an idea of how, how a middle-class Kentucky farmer, or not a middle, a, a lower-class Kentucky farmer can join the lower reaches of the upper class, okay? And largely it's hinged on his slaveholding and his ability to borrow against his um, enslaved people. So here's an example of, of a loan um, where it's a bank loan where a, 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 a slave, holder is putting up the value of his enslaved property to get money, okay? So this particular uh, loan is from uh, a bank in Louisiana, but this could just as easily be a bank in Kentucky. So then these mortgages, just like house mortgages today, home mortgages today, are combined into bonds, okay? And these bonds are sold on the bond market exactly back then as they would be today, and this is a way for people to invest in slavery all over the country and all over the world. So British, French, Spanish, Italian, you know, nobility, um, the, the, the state treasuries of European countries, um, wealthy Northerners were all investing in these bonds and it's a way that they could also be a part of the economy. 
So leasing, very lucrative for um, slaveholders. So this is an example of a lease um, that was drawn up in 1864 between this fellow William Christian Bullitt and his neighbor, a guy named William Soper, basically saying, uh, you know, he had more uh, enslaved people than he needed that season. So he is going to lease out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people for uh, $1,160 for a year. Okay. And it spells out the terms of the lease. And, you know, he's going to pay for their food and their room and board. Uh, he's going to clothe them. He's going to, you know, take care of their medical expenses, et cetera. Now, if you start leasing enslaved people, they're no longer, uh, you know, in your possession. So you might be worried about what's going to happen to them. So you take out insurance. Okay. So there's a thriving market in the antebellum era for slave insurance. And this is an ad taken from either the Louisville Courier or the Louisville Journal for a life insurance company that is specifically going to insure the value of enslaved people that you might have leased out to steamboats or some other dangerous pursuit. Um, and this, by the way, the very fact that there was an insurance industry that specialized in this was my entree into this entire project. Uh, I was able to learn about Kentuckians who took out these life insurance policies and then wondered who these people were. And I started doing my research. So um, Kentucky becomes the number two exporter of enslaved people after Virginia during this time period. Um, the cotton boom in the deep south triggers a huge demand for slave labor. Um, uh, prices for enslaved people triples between 1800 uh, and 1860. Um, and if you think about how few commodities other than something like Bitcoin increase that rapidly over the, uh, you know, a 60 year period. You know, I think you'd be happy if you could put your nest egg into something that could triple in value. So all of a sudden, uh, as prices rise, more and more and more people go into this business, okay? So if you look on the, 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 um, the Courier Journal archive, which is accessible in a variety of ways, including through the Louisville Free Public Library, and you just scroll through a sample newspaper, any issue, and you go to the back, you go to the, uh, the advertisements, you will find uh, an, an increasing number of ads, and I'm gonna show you some in a second, for small time business people who are doing slave trading as a sideline. So their, their main day job might be groceries, or it might be dry goods, or it might be furniture, okay, or livestock, but now they have a second line and that is human beings. Uh, and so sometimes they might be buying and selling livestock and human beings, buying and selling furniture and human beings. Um, Louisville, because it's a river port, becomes an important hub for the internal slave trade. Um, so this is over people bringing uh, enslaved people over land and they wanna get to the Ohio River so they can get down to the Mississippi River so they can get to the big, um, slave markets of Natchez, Mississippi and New Orleans, which are the two largest um, uh, hubs for the, the, the sort of on the receiving end of the internal slave trade. So one of the top three slave traders in the United States happened to live in Louisville, a guy named Rice Ballard. Uh, it, everybody always asks, is that Ballard High School? No, it isn't. It's a, it's a cousin of his, but it's not him. Um, Jefferson County's jailer, Stephen Chenoweth, uh, moonlights as a slave trader, apparently makes more money that way than he does as the jailer. He's the focus of an entire, most of the, ep of an episode for the uh, Reckoning radio series. Um, and so uh, we go into it in quite a bit of depth if you're interested in hearing about it. And I'll have a link in the last slide uh, as to how you can hear that. So, um, so this is what happens. You can see this. I don't know how well you can see this on your screen, but I will explain what you're looking at. So this is a biannual auditor's report for the state auditor of Kentucky. And to this day, the state legislature gets a report every two years on basically how's the state doing in terms of revenue? Uh, what's, it buy, what's it spending? What's it uh, what's take, coming in? So this has to do with taxation. So slaves in Kentucky were taxed in the same way that any other kind of property was taxed. So um, by 1860, 20% of all the tax revenue in Kentucky is coming from property tax revenue from enslaved people. 
So in, in between the year 1859 and 1860, we went from having 218,600 slaves to 200,005. So that's a net loss of about 13,000 human beings at the height of the cotton boom, okay? And look here, they are a smaller number of slaves in a one year period is worth more than more were worth one year before. So their total valuation goes from $107 million, from $102 million to $107 million, even though there's 13,000 fewer of them. That gives you an idea of just how robust the slave trade was leading up to the Civil War, and it helps explain a lot of what was going on in the eve of the Civil War. So just to make this very uh, vis visual here, th these are some of the ads that were put in the Courier Journal right during this period, 1859, 1860. And so, you know, 100 Negroes wanted, 300 Negroes wanted, okay? They're, they're, it's, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's, it's quite a market. So the next thing I wanna show you is that because it was such a lucrative line of work to, to sell enslaved people, buy and sell enslaved people, the people start to get a little aggressive and bend the law. And this leads to, if any of you have seen the movie 12 Years a Slave, this is that story, except it's happening in Louisville, it's not happening elsewhere. This is an example of a free man who is um, sold as a slave from Louisville to Louisiana. And the enslaver in Louisiana realizes that this man is actually a free man and he sues the slave trader. And the slave trader loses the case and the enslaved man is freed. And this is from the court ruling that I found at the, uh, the archives in, in uh, Frankfurt. Um, I don't wanna go into this in too much detail, but Kentucky had a, a specialization, especially in the, in the Lexington area. And that was selling young women, essentially into concubinage was the term that they used, which is essentially becoming mistresses of um, enslavers, usually uh, in the farther deeper into the South, especially in the New Orleans area. And so there was a, a slave trader in Lexington who specialized in these women. And this is a, a quote from the uh, journal of a senator, a US senator from Illinois, who visits Lexington and he goes into one of these special slave emporiums uh, where women are sold. Um, his name's um, Orville Brown, if I remember correctly, the senator. So um, something important happens in Kentucky in 1849, and that is that there had been brewing in the early part of the 19th century, an anti-slavery movement in Kentucky. Um, and I could talk about this at length, but we don't have time. And maybe Dr. Harlow will go into this a little bit, but uh, religion be, has a real role in this. Um, there are um, especially Presbyterian clergy, uh, including John Fee, who founds Berea College later, who are very involved in pushing an abolitionist agenda. But even those who are not as radical as someone like John Fee are still, have still come to the conclusion that it's not good business for Kentucky to continue as a slaveholding state for a variety of reasons. And so there is this um, um, drive to change the constitution of Kentucky to outlaw slavery, or at least to, to put uh, gradual emancipation into uh, the works. Um, so there is a convention called for in 1849 essentially to debate slavery and whether or not to, to abolish it in Kentucky. But instead of it going that way, it goes the other way. Uh, and it actually, Kentucky develops the strongest constitution, pro-slavery constitution in the country that basically enshrines into law that you can never get rid of slavery in Kentucky. And were it not for the 13th Amendment, which parenthetically, Kentucky did not ratify until 1976, um, uh, we might still have slavery in Kentucky based on the uh, 1850 constitution. Uh, and, but one of the key things they did in this constitution, and, and these things I believe are connected, okay, is that they um, uh, changed the taxing structure. 
away from what they called a, 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 a poll tax. So where each voter would get charged a certain amount of money to a fully property tax based economy. And here's what happens. As, as soon as they put that constitution into place, tax revenue rises from, from uh, the percentage of, of, of Kentucky's tax revenue that comes from slave property taxes uh, jumps to 20%, okay? And it stays more or less around there in the, in the, for that uh, decade period. So Kentucky is very, very dependent financially on, on slavery. This just talks about how much they strengthened the 1850, uh, slavery in the 1850 census. Uh, so real quick, uh, and then I'll we'll turn things over to Dr. Harlow, um, just to give you an idea of what was going on in, in Jefferson County. Um, the, according to the 1860 census in, in Jefferson County, there's roughly 100, uh, uh, 10,000 enslaved people. The average value roughly uh, 55,000 in today's dollars. Uh, and that means if you bring that up to the present, we're talking about half a billion dollars of value in today's dollars, half a billion dollars, okay? Um, so it gives you an idea. And again, Louisville, as well as the state of Kentucky, 20% of its revenue is coming from slave taxes. So it gives you an idea of just why Kentucky was so likely to support the Confederacy. So this is an editorial from the Louisville Courier in 1861. Um, and, and it makes really clear that, uh, that the argument for uh, joining the Confederacy against the Union to support slavery was financial. To wit, there are 250,000 slaves in Kentucky worth more than $100 million. To emancipate these Negroes would be to destroy at one blow more than one-fifth of the taxable property of the state. It would cut off one-fifth of the total revenue of the state. Additional taxes would have to be imposed on land, houses, and personal property. Many of the best and most loyal citizens of the Commonwealth would be reduced from affluence to, and luxury to ruin and beggary. And this was in the context, this editorial was to, um, to um, get more Kentucky men to join the Confederacy. Okay, so it was clearly an argument about money. Um, I will just mention in passing, since we're talking here at the end about the Civil War, uh, that there is a new project that our, my nonprofit organization, Reckoning Inc., has gotten involved with. It's called the African American Civil War Soldiers Project. And we are basically looking at the lives of the 23,700 uh, formerly enslaved men from Kentucky who joined the, uh, well, I should say African-American men, a large proportion of which were formerly enslaved, who joined the uh, Union Army. And we can learn a lot about them just by looking at all of these records. So um, the final thing I'll do is just put some information up on how you can learn more about the work of my organization, Reckoning Inc. Uh, our website, uh, we, if you have not already heard the Reckoning podcast, uh, all of it is archived on our website. Uh, we have a page devoted to this um, Civil War Soldiers Project um, and also my contact information. Now, uh, so I would now like to turn things over to uh, Dr. Luke Harlow. And I'm going to, I'm not sure how I can keep this screen up at the same time as I look at, yes, here we go. Um, uh, Dr. Luke Harlow is an associate professor of history at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, where he teaches course, courses on the Civil War era and American religious history. He is the author of Religion, Race, and the Making of Confederate Kentucky, 1830 to 1880, and has published several articles on religion, slavery, and emancipation in America. He serves as an associate editor of the Journal of the Civil War Era and is currently, currently working on his next book project, Faith in Republican Institutions, Lydia Maria Child and the American Problem of Religion and Democracy in the Civil War Era. And I turn things over to Dr. Harlow. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I, I, my charge here is to talk about uh, religion and slavery and, and those dimensions. And um, Dan's slide there at the end had the line about opposition to slavery was all about the money. And it's my job to say, uh, Yes, it was all about the money, but it was also all about the theology that was held by the majority of white Kentuckians in this period. 
Uh, I'd like to start out by just framing my comments with some general um, statistical information and then uh, work through uh, the way folks thought about the Bible and slavery into the three dominant positions, political positions that were held on the slavery question um, in Kentucky, religiously considered, and then what difference the Civil War and emancipation makes. Well, we can estimate that in the era of the American Civil War, and by that I mean roughly 1830 to 1880, um, about 60 to 70 percent of Kentuckians had a connection to an evangelical Protestant church. There are, of course, many types of believers uh, who are not evangelical Protestant, um, and Sister Nabel will help us with that in, in just a minute, but for my purposes, that's what I'm going to focus on. And those churches were Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, uh, and then the Restorationists, which is a broad kind of catch-all category that includes uh, the Disciples of Christ, the Christian churches, the Churches of Christ, and so on. Prior to uh, the Civil War and Emancipation, those churches were biracial, that is to say with enslaved members. Um, but if we only include white people, we are talking about even higher percentages of evangelical adherence, 70 to 80 percent of white Kentuckians connected to evangelical churches in some way. Membership numbers in this period are misleading because it is quite difficult in the 19th century to formally join a church. But even if we go by formal church membership numbers, um, not just attendance, not just people connected, by 1871 in 10, Kentuckians had formally joined a Baptist church. The Methodist rates of adherence and membership are nearly as high. More people attended church than voted, went to school, and these by a significant magnitude. Um, even considering restrictive voting standards of the 19th century, uh, the, the, the point here is that uh, the religious values I'm gonna talk about are absolutely shot through Kentucky culture and politics um, in this period and inescapably so. And because my charge is to talk about Protestantism in Kentucky and slavery and white attitudes, to do that is to really talk about the Bible argument for and against slavery. Because evangelical Protestants of all types throughout 19th century America drew their faith from a commitment to the primacy of the Bible as the divinely inspired authoritative guide for the shaping of Christian life and practice. Uh, these evangelicals shared a common method of biblical interpretation, uh, what scholars refer to as a common sense literalism, which is to say American evangelicals believed the Bible to be literally true, an eminently readable book that contains easily understandable, God-given teachings which apply to all people at all times. And with this understanding of the Bible, white Southerners, not just in Kentucky, but broadly crafted a Christian argument that justified slavery. By the time of the American Civil War, that pro-slavery argument had been sharpened, after decades of antagonism with anti-slavery believers in their midst over the biblical merits of slavery, and a stable of texts would appear in pro-slavery Christian writings, arguing transparently that the Bible sanctioned slaveholding. And, and this argument went something like this. Jesus of Nazareth lived in a world of slaveholders, but never discussed slavery in the Gospels, despite condemning many other sins. But other biblical texts were loaded with accounts of divine mandates for slaveholding. The Old Testament books of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy explained very carefully how the Hebrew people of God were to treat their slaves. In the New Testament, the writings of both Paul and Peter called on enslaved people to uh, obey their masters as they would obey their God. Probably most famously in the 19th century context, the epistle to Philemon, purportedly written by the Apostle Paul, seeks to affect the reconciliation of two uh, Christian believers. The letter's recipient, who was a master, a slave owner, and his fugitive uh, slave named Onesimus. In this letter, uh, Paul instructs Onesimus to return to his condition of bondage, um, but he hoped that Philemon might be treated, uh, uh, might treat the returned slave above that of a servant. Well, in a 19th century American context, where slaveholders assured critics that chattel were part of an extended family, where fugitive slave laws compelled escape slaves to return to their masters, the application of this text could not be missed. Now, if all of this to, to some uh, listeners may sound like biblical proof texting so-called, or picking and choosing texts um, to support the, the pro-slavery case, I can assure you this was not the case. Uh, pro-slavery theologians contended that the entirety of the biblical witness endorsed slavery for the biblical writers at base simply assumed slaveholding would be part of the world. 
This was God's natural order. Coming out of that sort of biblical kind of argument over slavery, there are really three positions that develop and are held fairly closely uh, in Kentucky. The first of which is uh, straightforwardly a pro-slavery position, and it is the most clear based on what I've said about Bible reading. Uh, the Bible says it, in other words, and there's not a lot of thinking or anxiety about the world around, so to speak. There might be some arguments about reforming slavery. Um, that American slavery could be brought more into line with the way that the Bible describes slavery, uh, more in line with the biblical witness, something like this. But overall, this is an argument that says um, the Bible says it, so the slaveholding order we live in is okay. And this really is the overwhelming position of religious whites in Kentucky, uh, overwhelmingly. I mean, this is the dominant position is pro-slavery uh, biblicism. Um, uh, you know, arguments for reform are really pro-slavery arguments. Because what are you saying when you call for reform? The institution itself isn't a problem. It's the way we do it. Slavery itself is okay. This is a theologically conservative position, pro-slavery uh, you know, pro Christianity. Also theologically conservative is a position that Dan gestured at in his comments, which is gradual emancipationism. And it really is something else politically, although not theologically. In general, gradual emancipation is a white supremacist position. It argues for a white's first emancipation that says America is a land for white people, that slavery is a stain on the land, and so we should end slavery. But you have to do that through constitutional amendment, through force of law, maybe legal mechanisms, court rulings, and so on. This is the dominant white position on how you end slavery from the American Revolution to the Civil War. This is the position held by Abraham Lincoln early in his political career and into his presidency, although the war changes his calculation. Uh, this is the position held by Kentucky's most famous politician in this period, Henry Clay. Uh, and for our purposes, or for my comments, it is the position held by a number of leading white clergy in Kentucky. For example, the Methodist Henry Bascom, uh, who had been the chaplain of the US House of Representatives, uh, then goes on to become the president of Transylvania University. He endorses gradual emancipation. The Presbyterian Robert J. Breckinridge uh, of Lexington, a leading member eventually of the faculty at Danville Theological Seminary, which is on the campus of Center College, uh, really perceived as the kind of Princeton of the West. Uh, he is a gradual emancipationist. Bowling Green Baptist uh, James M. Pendleton, who was a key player in various Baptist movements uh, in the period, uh, he is a gradual emancipationist. Uh, Alexander Campbell, among the Restorationists, the founder of the Churches of Christ, he is a restoration, or excuse me, he is a gradual emancipationist. Gradualism is a theologically uh, conservative position. It says, yes, the Bible says slavery is okay. We can't go against the Bible. But they want to ask, is American slavery the same thing as biblical slavery? There is no modern concept of race in the Bible. The Mosaic Code calls for a jubilee every seven years, the cancellation of all debts, the inclusion of enslaved people in the family structure. Does this happen in America, they want to ask. What about, as Dan mentioned in his comments, the slave trade so dominant in Kentucky that destroys enslaved families, um, even as no slave marriages are recognized by law? Does this look like Christian slavery? What about the predatory rape of enslaved women by their, by their uh, owners? Does any of this look like Christian slavery? So the gradualist position is, is, again, a conservative one because it is saying we take the Bible seriously and the Bible is a pro-slavery text, but the, the slavery we have in our midst does not look just. It does not look like what God has ordained. And so in Kentucky, as Dan mentioned in the 1849 canvas to change uh, the state constitution, many of the leading uh, emancipationist clergy are members of the anti-slavery uh, caucus, you might say, Robert J. Breckinridge, James Pendleton, and, and others. Uh, they fail in 1849, as, as Dan has already mentioned, um, but this is sort of a position, and it's a real position. It's one of political difference with the pro-slavery side. Finally, there's an abolitionist position, and this is really a different position altogether. This is a position that says, uh, abolitionists will say, whatever the letter of the Bible says about slavery, slavery should have ended yesterday. Uh, the spirit of the text, the message of Jesus overall, um, is against human oppression. Slavery is a moral outrage, a moral horror. We would do well to get rid of it as soon as we can. In Kentucky, the key white exponent of this position, 
uh, as, as Dan has already mentioned, is John G. Fee, who was an ordained New School Presbyterian minister um, uh, and eventually a kind of evangelical non-sectarian. During the Civil War, Fee engages in um, pretty expansive ministry to uh, refugees from slavery at, at Camp Nelson in central Kentucky, where some 13,000 enslaved people find freedom, then launches Berea College uh, on an interracial basis. After the war, with support from the Evangelical Abolitionist American Missionary Association, abolition is a minority position overwhelmingly among believing whites. Most believing whites, if they're pro-slavery or gradualist, view abolition as a heresy. But it's important to say here that abolition is the dominant position among believing blacks in Kentucky. Uh, we don't have good records uh, for obvious reasons um, about you know, the position of the enslaved and, 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 and their theology, but we have some, some good hints, and especially among those who escaped from slavery in Kentucky. And one such account is that of Henry Bibb. Henry Bibb was a devout Methodist, um, published a widely read narrative in 1849 of his many escapes from Kentucky slavery, winds up in Ontario. There he founds a newspaper called The Voice of the Fugitive. And in 1852, he writes a series of public letters to his old master. And in these public letters to his old master, I mean, that's the title they're under. He, he says that his former master, and I'm quoting here, professed to be a Christian, a leader in the Methodist church and a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet you sold my mother from her little children. You sold my brother George from his wife and dear little ones while he was a worthy member and a clergyman of the same church to which you belong. He argues, Bibb continues, that his former master professed to take the Bible as his standard of Christian duty. But slaveholding violates key teachings um, in, in the Bible all over the place. Uh, slavery was abominable, Bibb will argue. You shall know that there is a God in heaven who cannot harmonize human slavery with the Christian religion. You shall know that there is a law which is more binding on the consciences of slaves than that of Congress and any other human enactment. Bibb would write in his autobiography just a few years before this, and again, quoting, the slaves with but few exceptions have no confidence at all in white preaching because they preach a pro-slavery doctrine. Well, this is beyond the pale to most uh, believing whites in Kentucky. And as I've said, gradual emancipationists and pro-slavery believers, despite their differences on matters of politics, are actually quite aligned when it comes to matters of theology. One side, yes, politically supports perpetual slavery. The other side supports emancipation in some form. But for reasons of theology, they both think the kind of abolitionism of a John G. Fee or a Henry Bibb or someone like that is heresy. It goes against the, the written literal word of the Bible. The big three Protestant denominations, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, all had split over the slavery question in the 1830s and 40s along sectional lines, slaveholding, slave state, free state lines. And white Kentuckians are somewhat divided on this question, uh, though they mainly, mainly choose to stay in the uh, conservative pro-slavery options for reasons of theology. Uh, abolitionists will say that slavery can't be Christian, uh, but pro-slavery and gradualists, because of how they read the Bible, disagree with that point of view. And what comes to tip the scales ultimately is the civil war itself. And not just the civil war, but civil war and its emancipationist consequence, the way that emancipation comes in the United States. Many gradualists who I've said are white supremacists come to believe that emancipation and the way it came about was sinful. They come to believe that the abolition war, as they call it, is a horror and a problem. And so this conservative theology that had made space for difference politically before the war comes to unite religious conservatives in its aftermath, and it paves the way for a broad adherence among Kentucky whites to lost cause politics and lost cause religion. White Kentuckians do not support the Confederacy in large number during the war. Um, the state never secedes. I mean, this is common knowledge, but religiously, by the time you get to 1870 or so, for reasons of theology, white Kentuckians have effectively overwhelmingly embraced the old white pro-slavery Southern denominations, the Southern Methodists, the Southern Presbyterians, in 1877, Louisville becomes home to the flagship seminary of Southern Baptists for similar reasons. Even though the Civil War resolves the great question of slavery in terms of politics, and even as African Americans are leaving white churches in mass once emancipation is a reality, the United States will go forward as a nation free from slavery. Ultimately, we'll have multiracial birthright citizenship thanks to the 14th Amendment. For the purposes of religion, it's as if those things do not apply. The pro-slavery faith 
lives on. And so the war that has destroyed slavery does not destroy the beliefs that gave life to slavery. And in terms of the pro-slavery biblical method of interpreting the Bible lives on, in fact, down to the present day. And I'll end my comments there. Thank you so much, Dr. Harlow. Uh, I'm now going to turn things over to Sister Teresa Nebel. Uh, Sister Teresa is a member of the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, which has a 200-year history in Nelson County, uh, in Louisville, and many other places. Today, they are an international congregation with sis sisters in six countries. Their mission statement calls them to work for justice and solidarity with oppressed peoples especially the economically poor and women, and to care for the earth. Sister Teresa is an educator who has also served in parish ministry and health care, and she became very interested in the enslaved families of Nazareth and researched the community archives to gather data so their descendants would know their stories. I turn things over to you, Sister Teresa. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm Sister Teresa Knabel, uh, Sister of Charity of Nazareth, and I'm representing the sisters here today. We were slaveholders. This is our story told within the larger context of the Catholic Church in Kentucky. It is told from the viewpoint of the slaveholder as virtually nothing is recorded from those who were enslaved. The Diocese of Bardstown was established in 1808 with Bishop Flaget as the first bishop. Guidelines were issued to Catholics who believed it was necessary to own enslaved persons, do not mistreat them, instruct them in the Catholic faith and allow them to practice the religion. If it's necessary to sell someone, sell only to another Catholic family so they can practice the religion. Husbands shall not be separated from their wives. These beautiful buildings here at Nazareth were built by the hard labor of enslaved men who made the bricks and laid them in place. That these buildings are still standing today is a testimony to their labors. Some of our early sisters brought enslaved persons with them as their dowry. Later, we did purchase some families or individuals from other Catholics. It was the bishop or priest who made the purchase for us with the help of an agent. This bill of sale reads, no, that Elizabeth Westcott, for $1,000 paid by the Right Reverend B Benedict Flaché of Bartstown, sold a certain female slave named Louisa and two boys, slaves, named William and Henry, for the use of the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth. William was six years old. His little brother, Henry, was four. Very few persons were sold, and usually, it was so a husband could be with his wife who lived on a different farm so that they could be near each other. This small document from our archives has been most helpful in identifying names of the men, women, and children who lived at Nazareth. It was probably compiled by one of the sisters in the mid 1850s. On this page of adults, we find the two brothers we met earlier, now adults. The second name on the list of men is Bill Butler. His wife is Louisa, shown on the lower part of the women's page. The third man named is Henry Butler, Bill's younger brother, whose wife was Emily, the fourth name on the woman's page. Children were listed with birth dates under the name of the mother. Father's names only appeared in baptismal records. Whoever claimed ownership of the mother also claimed ownership of her children. Under Emily's name, we see three children, two of whom died very young. Under Louise's name, we see two daughters. Baptisms were a joyful occasion at Nazareth. They were held in the church and celebrated by all with a feast afterwards. In a letter from Sister Isabella to Sister Claudia in Nashville, we are told about a baptism of two babies. Mary Bean and Jane Bevan intend to have a christening here about Christmas, and you are all invited to come up to the frolic and get some of the plum cake. Mary Bean, 
and Jane Viven. We have here uh, Isidore, the son of Mary and Harry Bevan, and Charles Henry, the son of Jane and Harry Bevan. Excuse me, I think I said Mary and Harry Bean. This is from the baptismal registry at Nazareth and records the christening of these babies. Marriages were also celebrated in the church. Even though marriages among enslaved people were not recognized by the state of Kentucky, the priests blessed the couple in church followed by a celebration prepared by the sisters. You will recognize these two names, Emily and Harry Butler, as we saw them earlier. In a letter to Sister Claudia in Nashville, Mother Frances wrote, tomorrow, Emily and Harry are to be married. Great preparations are going on today. Our good confessor will perform the ceremony. Soon after the end of the war, Kentucky began to recognize the marriage of free persons. Each couple could appear at the county courthouse and declare the number of years they lived together. The state recorded this information and granted the couple a certificate of marriage. This document for Henry and Emily Butler is recorded in the Nelson County Courthouse. Notice it says they lived together as husband and wife for the past 20 years. This may be unique to Nazareth as I've not heard of it in any other place. An article in an 1861 issue of The Guardian, which was the precursor of the record, the Archdiocese newspaper, reports on a retreat for students and servants. Bishop Spalding preached a retreat to the young ladies of Nazareth Academy. The retreat began on Monday evening and ended on Friday morning when 98 students received communion with much fervor. These were the days when communion was received very rarely. A striking feature of the retreat was the regular attendance of all the servants, who besides hearing the general instructions, had special ones of their own given by the bishop. More than 30 of them reverently received Holy Communion on Friday morning. It was the most gratifying spectacle to witness the fervor of these poor servants. All are equal before God, whose son died equally for the salvation of all. The Catholic Church quietly seeks to improve the condition of the slave, teaching him that he has a soul to save, that he must save it by obeying his earthly master for the love of his heavenly master, as St. Paul taught. Up to now, I've been speaking of religious practices at Nazareth. These quotes are from a letter of Mother Columba in October, 1862, where she complained we had lost our overseer who went off to war. The farm was in disarray and the servants were deserting. We needed someone to quote, control our blacks, unquote. By 1864, the Union Army was desperate for new recruits and promised freedom to any enslaved man of Kentucky who could make it to a recruiting station. Nine of Nazareth's men left, making the treacherous journey to Louisville, Lebanon, or Camp Nelson in Nicholasville. They had to walk the distance mostly at night, could not walk the roads as they risked being caught by the slave patrol looking for runaways. Mother Columba tells of our loss in a letter dated August, 1864. Six more of ours left the first of this week. A Negro regiment was stationed near Bartstown for about two weeks. They are quiet as far as I know. This is the military record of a young man from Nazareth named Ignatius Bean. He was 25 when he enlisted in the US Colored Troops at the recruiting office in Lebanon. You will notice his name is listed as Ignatius Nazareth. He was trained at Fort Nelson and served in the infantry. In our early annals, Sister Marie Menard gives an account of emancipation at Nazareth. 
the government has suddenly emancipated 3 million slaves. Here, we have about 30 counting the children. Nearly all were born and raised here. They are devoted to Nazareth and the news far from giving them joy has caused quite a lamentation to arise among them. Remember, this is written from the viewpoint of the slave owner, not the enslaved. Such seem to be the sentiments of many good and faithful servants. Others, eager for liberty and novelty, seem to be filled with bright anticipation. So I think you can see that the older people were worried what would happen to them. The younger people were thinking, I'm free at last. I'm out of here. I've got a whole new life ahead of me. Mother had a dinner prepared for ours. They met for the last time around the old tables in the kitchen. A good supply of clothing and provisions has been prepared for each. They've rented small huts in the neighborhood for they say they cannot go far from home. We celebrated our centennial uh, in 1912. On a beautiful Saturday in October, the freed men and women from Nazareth, along with their families, were invited back for a day long celebration touring the buildings in the campus. They enjoyed a special dinner served by the sisters, followed by music and dancing. A highlight of the day was the picture taking. Remember, this is 47 years after emancipation. So this is three or four generations of people. Soon after the war ended, the church recognized the need to educate the church of the freed people. Our sisters responded to the call by opening schools in 1871 at St. Augustine in Louisville and St. Monica in Bardstown. Later, we opened schools for African-Americans in five other states. These schools continued for nearly 100 years until integration became effective. To provide quality of health care, the sisters built a new wing to St. Joseph Hospital in Lexington to allow admission of African-Americans as patients in 1877. In Alabama, our sisters opened two hospitals in response to requests for help from the people. The hospitals had a threefold purpose, to take care of African-American patients, to give African-American doctors a place where they could practice medicine, and to serve as a teaching hospital for African-American nurses and interns in training. During the Jubilee year of 2000, the Sisters of Charity, together with the Dominican Sisters of Peace at St. Catharines and the Sisters of Loretta, joined in a public prayer service to ask for forgiveness for our participation in the slave trade. We offered scholarships for young African-American women to attend school at Presentation Academy, Bethlehem High School in Bartstown, and Spalding University. During our bicentennial year in 2012, we dedicated a monument to those enslaved persons buried in our cemetery with their names engraved on the back so they would never be forgotten. The front is graced with a beautiful plaque designed by our local sculptor, Ed Hamilton. During the past year, we have reached out to assist the residents of the West End Louisville through grants for housing and small business loans. We gave a two and a half million dollar grant to the Urban League for affordable housing. We invested a million dollars with Al Homes for low interest loans to black businesses and to prevent evictions in the West End. We are preparing an exhibit at Nazareth of our enslaved families to make them more visible to us and to all who visit here. Our archival center is open to anyone doing family research to help them to know their history. Our sisters are very active in advocacy work writing letters to our congresspersons in support of bills such as H.R. 40 for a study of reparations and the John Lewis Voting Act. Back to you, Dan. Thank you, sister. We are now going to open 
up the uh, floor to questions, and we've already gotten quite a few uh, in the chat. And I'm going to turn things over to Sarah, who is going to um, facilitate asking the questions that are in the chat. All right. I think we'll start with one uh, for all three of you to respond to. Um, and uh, that question would be, what, what are the parallels of the subject matter um, that you all have each individually discussed to where we are today in the city of Louisville, um, reckoning with the legacy of, of slavery in Kentucky? Well, I will just say that uh, it is my opinion that you can really look at using the lens of understanding what happened under slavery and in the 19th century civil war and the aftermath in the 19th the late 19th century and all of the racial violence that happened in kentucky um, and the jim crow laws that were passed and segregating of the schools etc um, and understand so much it, it really helps explain what we see in the daily newspaper on the daily news. Um, and it's the thing that I would most recommend to any sort of thinking uh, citizen of the Commonwealth of Kentucky to, to, to try to understand some of this history so you can better understand the issues that are coming before voters today, can better understand everything from zoning issues to economic issues to you know, business development issues. Once you sort of put those glasses on, it, it, it's a, you're able to make more sense of the present, in my opinion. I would just say that um, slavery has been so destructive to the family unit. And I think that has had repercussions over the time since then. And it's still a struggle. Uh, we have never valued the African-American male. And uh, for a man to try to grow in that self-image, and to claim his own power, it, it's difficult in a um, systemic racist society. For my own part, uh, what I would add is that, um, you know, my, my discussion involved a lot of discussion about theology and what people believe. And I would say that beliefs never come to us in a vacuum. Uh, they never come to us um, unadorned or, or uninfluenced by culture or things like that. And so, there's no such thing as pure form theology. There's no such thing as pure form ideas, pure form <laughs> politics. Everything is embedded in place and time and, and context. And um, you know, there, there is with us uh, in this present day, a, a profound theology that says you, you can do that and, and is directly uh, and, and overtly, you know, and, it, and it's privileging of certain ways of reading the Bible, I would say historically racist. And I would say that the, the pro-slavery theology that was invented um, in the 19th century was the seedbed for what became uh, fundamentalism and then ultimately uh, modern right-wing uh, evangelical Christianity. And I say that as someone who um, has spent uh, time in those churches and is a Christian himself. I mean, I think this is a, if, if you're the kind of person who uh, morally wants to reckon with these issues, you would do well to reckon with where your theology comes from. Uh, and then I will, um, I think we have time for one more, uh, and this comes in from Sister Eleanor Craig. I admire the charity's focus on the enslaved individuals rather than on our white errors in practicing enslavement. What would you, Dan and Luke, recommend for the rest of us to strengthen the focus on the enslaved? You know, for, for, for my part, uh, I, think, I think the focus, uh, that, that, that question is a really powerful question. I mean, we have, within the historical discipline, there are known limits to uh, archival sources. Um, I mean, this is, this is a known fact. I mean, this is, this is a question not just for historians of slavery, but for historians of the, press, of the oppressed more broadly. Um, how do you find records of these people's lives and, and what, what do you do to, to kind of uh, facilitate that? One of the ways to do that is to, in, in the case of my, my example of citing Henry Bibb, um, is sometimes you have to look outside the state to find people who uh, were part of the system um, and have, have voices. Another way to do it is to read traditional archi archival sources against the grain. I think the project that Dan is involved with um, is a really good example of how you can recover voices without uh, you know, finding people who are enslaved on plantations, things of this nature, 
um, and have records that, that might come through other, other, other avenues that might not be in their voice. And then the final one, and, and this is really to, to pivot to Dan, is we have living examples of people who uh, documented their experience through different channels. And one of the best places you can see that in this period is folks who wound up in the US colored troops. Uh, those kind of sources, we do have federal records of, of those lives and, it, and they're glimpses, they're, they're not, they're not um, the whole story, but they're a little bit, they give you a slice and then you can extrapolate from there and build out the context. Just real quick before we, we, we part. Uh, so there are a variety of resources, uh, which, and, and what we're trying to do on our website, reckoningradio.org is to be sort of a, a nexus for as many of these historical sources as possible. On our website, we have uh, roughly 125 oral histories that were taken uh, with formerly enslaved Kentuckians in the 1930s, mostly as part of the Federal Writers Project under the WPA, but a handful of them come from other sources. Um, and so these are, to a large part, first person storytelling that was you know, written down, we hope verbatim, um, of what these people had to say about their upbringing. Then in addition to the Henry Bibb memoir that uh, Dr. Harlow mentioned, there are a handful of other uh, book length uh, memoirs that were left behind by formerly enslaved Kentuckians who wrote them either uh, after escaping from slavery in the 1840s and 50s or after the Civil War. So uh, there's a, a wonderful memoir from um, Elijah P. Mars who, who founded, was one of the co-founders of Simmons College. Uh, there is a guy named Peter Bruner uh, who was also a USCT soldier who has written a, a pretty gripping book. And then there's a guy, and I'm forgetting his name, who was enslaved in Nelson County. Um, and he specifically, and he was enslaved by Catholic enslavers. And he specifically talks about um, the wife and the family trying to basically church them, you know, get them church. And her husband says, no, no, no. If you give them too much access to, to religion and the Bible, you will inflame their desire for freedom. So he forbids her from allowing them to, to go to church. So um, th there are, you know, reading some of those sources, um, at least for me, has really helped bring this time period alive uh, in a way that um, you know, few other things have done. Dan, was it Daniel Rudd you were thinking of? No. In Nelson uh, County? No, no. I, uh, I'll, I'll find it. Yes. Okay. Josiah Henson. Yes, uh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, we have a bibliography on our website, reckoningradio.org, that lists uh, all of those memoirs, along with a ton of other books pertaining to slavery in Kentucky, as well as journal articles. So if you want to uh, do a little research, you can go on our website, reckoningradio.org, uh, and click on the bibliography link, and there's an awful lot there in addition to these 125 oral histories that were done in the 1930s. This has been extraordinary, and I, I hate that we have to draw it to a close, um, but just out of respect for the hour that people have committed for us, um, I think we will. I do ask everyone that has joined us today to look for a kind of part two of this Essential Conversations First Steps, where we'll be talking with Hannah Drake and Josh Miller of the Unknown Project about their art installation on the Banks of Freedom. Uh, it will have some wonderful resonance with some of the topics that have been opened up uh, with our fabulous panelists today. Um, I wish we could do a part two and maybe after the festival this year, you all might consider joining us again um, to help us with the next steps of these essential conversations. You've, you've been tremendous. Uh, heartfelt gratitude to all three of you. Thank you. Thank you so much.